Hi guys, welcome to Lore of the Cards, the series that looks to reveal the lore hidden within your Hearthstone deck. Today, we kick off a string of several in-depth episodes to celebrate the Grand Tournament's release, looking at a few cards that came with this expansion. You guys voted on the first, and it was one of the closest votes we've seen, with Nexus Champion Sarad just about out-jousting Ronin and Anubarak. Sarad has next to no lore connected to himself. While we will be looking at what little there is, we will be mainly focusing on the race to which Sarad belongs, the Ethereals, and a few key players within their society. So, in a way, we're also covering the Ethereal Arcanist too. The art of the card is by Marcelo Vignali, who currently resides in Los Angeles. Both Marcelo's parents are Argentinian, and when Marcelo first went to the States, he was unable to speak the language. So at first, he used his gift for drawing as a means of communication with others. From these humble beginnings, Vignali would go on to create works for EA, Rockstar, Wizards of the Coast, and of course, Blizzard. He has also worked for a couple of animation studios too, including Disney, and is currently the art director of Sony Pictures Animation. He will often post current works to his blog, showing off his extremely varied style, ranging from realistic backgrounds to caricatures, and occasionally post to his YouTube channel. Vignali also occasionally promotes his daughter's budding talent for animation. In Hearthstone, we have only just started to see Vignali's work come to cards, with Flash Heel and Sarad showing off his abilities. But Vignali is also responsible for one of Hearthstone's most iconic characters, the Innkeeper, whose art was originally used in the Warcraft trading card game for the perfect stout card. Moving on to the lore behind Sarad. The Ethereals used to dwell on their home planet, Koresh, ruled over by their leader, Nexus King Salhadar, and his council of Nexus Princes. While Koresh was a dry planet, life flourished upon its surface, including an extremely advanced race of flesh and blood that were one day destined to become the Ethereals. What these humanoids looked like, we do not precisely know. The peace of Koresh was shattered when the armies of the Void invaded the world. While the Void is the name of the dark energy wielded by warlocks, and sometimes used by shaman to bind elementals in place, it is also a plane of existence. This chaotic realm is home to the Void Walkers. The Void's army was led by the tremendous Void Lord called Demensius, the All Devouring. Void Lords are one of the most powerful variation of Void Walkers, second only to Void Gods, which are extremely rare. As his epithet suggests, Demensius consumes energy to become even more powerful himself. This is what he sought to do to Koresh. How Demensius discovered Koresh? is not known, but his domination of the planet was near instantaneous. The Void Lord opened several portals around Koresh that led to the Void and the Twisting Nether, the realm where demons reside. This act flooded the planet with the shadow energies of the Void and the arcane forces of the Twisting Nether. To avoid being torn apart by these powerful forces, one race used their advanced technology to defend themselves. They constructed magical barriers around their cities to block the torrent of energies. While they did block the dark energies of the void, the arcane forced itself through the barriers and disintegrated the flesh of those within them. Despite their bodies being destroyed, all was not lost. The arcane energy bound with the souls of those that have perished, creating an entirely new race, the Ethereals, beings of pure energy. While their souls were still intact, they barely clung to existence. The Ethereals acted quickly, binding their bodies within enchanted cloth, giving their souls form and stability. This is the only real indication we have of what the Ethereals may have looked like before their transformation. A humanoid body shape, very similar to that of the humans on Azeroth. 
Despite this fearsome attack that altered the appearance of their race forever, the Ethereals found their new form to be more powerful than their previous. Their intelligence and affinity for magic increased, as well as being able to compact their bodies if they desired. With their new found strength, they were able to perform an act that would have previously been impossible. Resist Dementius. The Ethereals fought hard and were able to battle the Void Lord and his forces to a standstill. This minor victory was short lived, however, as Dementius summoned even more creatures from the Void through his portals in order to bolster the ranks of his army. Finally admitting defeat, the Ethereals needed to escape, and thanks to their new form, they were able to. Their new incorporeal forms allowed them to reside within the Twisting Nether. Saying goodbye to their homeworld, they travelled through the portals created by Dementius and escaped. The ultimate fate of Koresh is still currently unknown, whether it was destroyed, swallowed up by the Void, or a barren planet, devoid of life, left untouched. After the destruction of their planet, the once united Ethereal society splintered off into various different groups and factions, often led by a Nexus Prince. The Protectorate, Consortium and Ethereum are three of the larger groups we'll discuss later. How the Ethereals lived before their transformation cannot be said with any certainty, though the race's current traits may be drawn from how they used to live. Ethereals are opportunistic merchants and treasure hunters who will always put their needs ahead of the needs of others. This can be seen in Karazhan, the old home of Medivh, once Azeroth's most powerful mage. When Medivh vanished, his home also sealed itself off, but later opened. The Ethereals were the first to begin searching through Medivh's tomes and valuables, attacking any who dared to claim them for themselves. The Ethereals will ally themselves with anyone or anything that helps them achieve their goals, whether they are good or evil is of no concern to them. While some have had friendly relations with the Alliance and Horde, just as many, if not more, have attacked members of those factions. The Ethereal Cadavan is a prime example of the erratic loyalties of the race. Cadavan enters the lore of Warcraft in the service of Ragnarok Bloodreaver, a death knight created by Gul'dan. When the Horde were a force of evil, it was ruled from behind the scenes by Gul'dan and his Shadow Council. That was until the great Orgrim Doomhammer killed the first Warchief and Gul'dan's council to drive their evil influence from the Horde. As Doomhammer went to strike down Gul'dan, the insidious Warlock reasoned that without him there were no spellcasters within the Horde, and the mages of the Alliance would tear their forces apart. Doomhammer begrudgingly let Gul'dan live, and in return Gul'dan provided Doomhammer with the Death Knights. These horrors were created by taking the corpses of the fallen knights of the Alliance and binding the soul of a member of the slain Shadow Council to that body. While their bodies were frail, the Death Knights still possessed the dark, terrifying magics they had mastered in life. For an abundance of coin, Cadavan agreed to help Blood Reaver in his goals of taking over the world of Outland and after that, Azeroth. He did this by providing a device that with no risk to Ragnarok's forces would capture the Nether Dragons native to Outland. Blood Reaver then used Cadavan's device and bent the Drakes to his will to create an almost unstoppable army. Cadavan further proved his resourcefulness when he was able to improve his trap, in return for some more money, to capture the blue dragon Tiragosa. She had been drawn to Outland by the strange energies of the Nether Drakes. With help from her companions, Tiragosa only narrowly avoided capture. Gadavan's loyalties immediately shifted when he was later caught by surprise by his former victim, Tiragosa. The dragon sought to shut down the device that enslaved the Nether Dragons, and Gadavan agreed to help her in exchange for his life. Cadavan's device was destroyed before he could disable it, 
immediately burning through the Nether Dragon's energies that were essential for them to survive. Wanting to save these peculiar dragons, Tiragosa led them to Azeroth to find a source of magic to sustain them, Kadavan still within her grasp. The Ethereal now wanders Azeroth, seeking the next customer with enough coin to afford his exotic wares. In many ways, Ethereals are similar to goblins, selfish with a flair for technology. Unlike goblins, however, Ethereal technology appears to be more advanced, reliable and refined. They have been able to construct giant ecodomes where life flourishes in environments where it would otherwise not and are able to communicate through holographic image projection. The Ethereals are also the only known race to practice and have the ability to use Techromancy. This magic school allows them to modify the arcane properties of any item and create small pocket dimensions. Members of the Alliance and Horde can make use of an Ethereal's skills for a fee of course to purchase their own pocket dimensions, known as Void Storage, which store items of value and also to alter the appearance and properties of their equipment. The ability to alter a piece of gear's properties was later removed in World of Warcraft for gameplay reasons. Ethereals made their debut within World of Warcraft during the Burning Crusade expansion. Like the Alliance and Horde, they had travelled to the shattered world of Outland, but unlike the two factions that sought to combat the destructive demonic army known as the Burning Legion, the Ethereals travelled there to seek out further entrepreneurial ventures. The faction that the Alliance and Horde came into contact the most with were the Consortium. This group, led by Nexus Prince Haramad, are skilled merchants, smugglers and thieves that saw the Alliance and Horde as great business partners, even going as far as giving adventurers that helped them out on multiple occasions a salary of gems. The Consortium also hired adventurers to take out rival ethereal groups. In the southern regions of Terracar Forest lies the Orchindune, a destroyed Draenei mausoleum. Though destroyed, many magical artefacts still lay within the structure. A group of ethereals led by Nexus Prince Shafar took over the wing known as the Mana Tombs and began stockpiling valuables and absorbing the arcane energy within the halls. The Consortium also sought the treasures that lay within, but Shafar had erected several wards to prevent any rival ethereals from entering. Adventurers were hired to venture in and defeat the covetous Shafar, allowing the consortium to enter the ruins. Nexus Prince Haramad is constantly in hiding, only talking to employees through a holographic projection of himself. The prince does this for his own safety, as over the years he has made many enemies that would leap at the chance to kill him if he were ever out in the open. When you spend your life swindling others and making shady deals, that's what happens after all. The consortium have ethereal allies in the Protectorate, who dedicate themselves to stopping the Ethereum. The Ethereum were the ruling class of Koresh and continued to be led by Nexus King Salhadar. After being driven from their homeworld by Demensius, the Ethereum vowed to stop at nothing to avenge their lost home. This quest for vengeance has driven them to extremes that the Protectorate view as just as dangerous as Demensius himself. The Ethereum began to infuse their energy with that of the Void, creating an entirely new breed of Ethereal, Nexus Stalkers. These shadowy hybrids are seen as aberrations by the Protectorate. After all, they willingly bound themselves to the forces Demensius once used to violate their home world. By combining with the Void, the Nexus Stalkers gain the ability to drain the energies of their adversaries. However, the Protectorate were able to stop these abominations by killing Salhadar. With Salhadar's defeat, the Ethereum were dealt a devastating blow, but not entirely destroyed, as there are still many subgroups to the organisation. The Bashir, for example, could be found smuggling powerful mana cells for the disgraced Blood Elf leader, Kael'thas Sunstrider. The actual lore surrounding Sarad is minimal at best, the character being created specifically for his Grand Tournament card. 
It is said that the Ethereals hold their own jousting contest, and that Sarad is the champion of this test of skill. Where it is held is not mentioned, whether it be in the Twisting Nether or upon a planet the Ethereals have discovered on their travels. It's also possible that Sarad is the champion of a single faction of Ethereals, rather than of the entire race. As mentioned previously, some of these factions are not on the friendliest of terms, and as a result, it's hard to imagine them all coming together for a jousting competition. The origins of Sarad's mount are also shrouded in mystery. A beast of a similar genetic makeup to Sarad himself, but with the body of a camel. Were the ethereal race able to save other beasts when fleeing their homeworld, or have they learnt the ability to shapeshift? as well as compact their bodies. Sarad's card flavour plays a lot into the personality of his race. When entering play, he looks to barter for victory, trying to get the enemy hero to concede in exchange for their life. Sarad's inspire mechanic shows off his race's willingness to trade, paying the hero for aid in combat with one of his new acquisitions, a spell card. So, there you have it, the lore of the Ethereals looking at a few key organisations and the history of the race. The race is mysterious, and there are parts of their physiology that are still debated. There is evidence to suggest that they do not sleep, but they do need to eat and drink, as ethereal merchants sell food exclusive to their race. The existence of ethereal liquor adds to this possibility. It comes with a curious warning that fleshy imbibers may experience odd effects when consuming, hinting that perhaps this beverage is better suited to those who are decidedly unfleshy, the ethereals themselves. Either way, if you've enjoyed this episode, a like, share and a subscription are really appreciated. They help this channel out a ton. If you've enjoyed the art, I put all the artists I could find in the description below. Of course, if you prefer your loyalties to remain mysterious, like those of the Ethereals, you can always hit the dislike button, but that would make you a dick. As the vote was so close last time, I'm putting Anubarak and Ronin back up for the vote. Only this time, the Murloc Knight joins them. If you pick the Murloc Knight, I'll be looking at Murloc lore in general. If there's a character you really want to see put up for the vote, let me know in the comments below. I've also started a couple of new little series, a less thorough lore of the cards which briefly looks at cards without much lore behind them, and lore on the Heroes of the Storm characters. I've covered the Butcher and Leoric, and should have the Monk up soon. Response to these has been pretty damn positive so far, but further feedback would be really appreciated. Are they things you still want to see on the channel? With that, all that's left to say is I hope you enjoyed, happy hearthstoning, and I'll see you next time for more Lore of the Cards. <laughs>